Hi, my name is Niall Smith. I'm Head of Research at Cork Institute of Technology and I'm also Head of Black Rock Castle Observatory. And tonight I'm going to be talking about how our view of the universe has changed from the early models, from the people of Newgrange through to today. And I'm also going to explore how that has profoundly changed our view of ourselves, our place and our importance in this vast universe. I hope you get a chance to join me. Thank you very much for coming along tonight. My name is Niall. Uh, I'm just fascinated by the universe. I love the fact that we uh, know stuff about our universe and I think it's one of the great stories that we should share between each other. Um, we do in Ireland very easily and well celebrate music and tradition and heritage and so on. We don't do a bad job with the science but we could do better. But I think as a species, as people, uh, our story is amazing and that's a little bit what I want to get a little bit across tonight and as Mary said ideally in the classroom we don't want everybody sitting down but tonight at some point you kind of have to go through maybe sort of a, uh, a run through the whole bit before you can actually start to, to do spin-off activities which might be more interactive at any stage please feel free to uh, ask questions offer a separate opinion whatever it might be um, uh, or, and, and we can do something at the end I am unfortunately inclined to get into a rhythm, so don't let me stay on a set of train tracks if you're not happy with the direction that I'm going, if you have a counter view or a question. I'm not going to say anything vaguely offensive tonight, so I don't mean from that perspective, but you might have something where you have an anecdote that you want to share with people, whatever it may be. So we, we talk about building models of the universe, because actually one of the things, and by the way, whether you're a teacher or not, it, it, hopefully you get something interesting. I've tried to craft it so that will be the case. But one of the things we're asked to do is to build models of the universe. How do we know what a universe looks like? So the way I want to look at it is first by looking at what we know about the universe today. And then I'm going to kind of go back and figure out how did we get here. And the reason why I want to do it this way is that uh, there's maybe not complete uh, unanimity of understanding in the audience uh, amongst uh, about what the universe looks like today. So I feel that if you, if you put the model there and then you figure out how you get to it at least you know where we're going on this particular journey so today we believe the universe to be 13.7 billion years old which means that it actually has a finite lifetime now many of us may have know this already but just think of what we just said there the universe has a finite lifetime as far as we know it wasn't always there so at some point in 13.7 billion years ago the universe came into existence that's an enormous statement to make. We often gloss over it as if it's just the way things are. So we we'll come to reasons later on as to why we think it's 30.7 billion years ago. The stuff we can see in the universe, a lot of us will be familiar with this. We have our Earth, we have our solar system, which is the sun and the planets. And then we have our galaxy. So we sit at the edge of a spiral galaxy, roughly here. It's called a spiral galaxy because it looks a bit like a spiral. And many of you may know that within this, there's about 100,000 million stars, each of which happens to be very similar. A bit of a variation, a bit like people, but roughly all the same, like our sun. So we have 100,000 million of these. Then we have a bunch of galaxies that are close together. They're called the local group. And then there's a bigger bunch, which we call the local supercluster. You don't have to really, these two bits are not so important. I think they're interesting for various reasons. And then we have the universe, which is made up of all of those bits. But if we just run back through it, the main constituents of the universe are pretty straightforward. There are planets, there are stars, and then the stars and the planets come together to make galaxies. And then you just have more of those. So the universe is actually very rep repetitious in, in the way it's constructed. So, 100 million stars, mostly like our sun, at least as many planets. There's lots of hydrogen gas, and I'll come back to that in a few minutes' time. We do have a few exotic objects, like black holes, but not so many of those. They don't dominate the universe. The universe is really, in terms of stuff we can see, dominated by stars, and there's roughly 100 billion galaxies, we think. So 100 billion galaxies, each with 100 billion stars, that's a lot of galaxies. So the first thing that we were saying today is two things. The universe has a finite age and it's got a lot of stuff in it. That makes the universe fascinating. Uh, it's also amazing that I can actually say that. 
because when you think about the scale of the universe, I'm saying that as part of a species that's sitting on a very small planet in a very big universe, and yet I can make this claim. So this, this we know. If we look a little bit more closely at our solar system, this is a very quick run through, by the way. So you have the Sun, you have the inner planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, and then you have the outer planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And of course, we can have the debate over whether poor old Pluto out here remains a planet or not. I think a lot of the evidence really is debatable one way or the other, it depends on how you define a planet exactly. Um, and that's certainly something that in school you can, you can start a discussion on it. But we also have visitors that come to us every so often, comets, and we have lumps of rock which are very small. This is not the scale. So these asteroids are only a couple of kilometers wide or long. And they float around the solar system. Every so often they bump into things. 65 million years ago, if you were a dinosaur, that was unfortunate for you. But 65 million years ago, when the dinosaurs had killed off, that allowed us as mammals to take over. We were actually being suppressed by the dinosaurs. And when the dinosaurs were not out, maybe a simplistic way of looking at it, it helped us. So uh, maybe asteroids aren't all bad. Um, but the universe, if we look at it, in the greater context, uh, is made of this normal matter. This is the stuff I've been talking about, the stars, the planets, in your typical pie chart, 4%, and the other 96%, uh, roughly 95%, is made of two things, dark matter and dark energy. Um, I'll explain to you in a few minutes kind of how we know about this a little bit. I'll explain what observations allow us. But I'll also draw attention to the comment, we've no idea what this is. Now, to me, that's really fascinating. We don't know what 95% of the universe really is made of. We can see only 5%, 4 or 5% in the stars and the planets. The other stuff, we don't know what it's made of. And that's true as we stand here today. So for the younger people in the audience, and if we're taking from a teaching point of view, this is something which we don't at the moment understand, and we got to get somebody somewhere to help us to figure it out. Why not our students? Why not our pupils? So this, we got to figure smart ways to look at the universe to figure out what most of it is made of. Why that's also important is this. It means there's a universe out there yet to be discovered. I mentioned a minute ago the universe is repetitious. Actually it, it is, but there's bits of it, the majority of it, which we really don't understand, even if it looks repetitious. So that's kind of what we know about the universe today. Stars, galaxies, planets, dark energy, dark matter, it's expanding, it's 13.7 billion years old. That's roughly what the universe is. So how did we come to this realization? And the reason why this for us is interesting in part is because this is a, an example of a scientific discovery story. So if you're in this mound, and many of us will recognize it, have any of you been to New Range? Yeah brilliant place and if you haven't really go there but roughly 5,000 years ago Newgrange was built aligning with the midwinter sun as it rises a few days either side as well um, and that we know about the mound actually we know very little else because there's no written records what we do know because we can imagine this if you live 5,000 years ago then any model that these people would have had about the universe in other words what they thought the universe was made of where they thought it came from, how old they thought it was, they would have based that on just a few simple facts, because they didn't have telescopes, for example. So they would have seen that stars twinkle, they would have used their eyes only, they would have seen that there were these points of light that move, we call those planets today, but to them, I don't know what they were, we don't know what they, what they thought they were, but they would have seen that. And they would have also seen every so often shooting stars or comets. So to a naked eye observer, you'll see roughly this, twinkling stars, maybe a few different colours in the stars. You see them, uh, points that move in the sky, uh, and then you also see things that come every so often. That's really pretty much as much as you can observe. So how do you build a model around that information? Well, people tried, and we can start with one of the most famous philosophers of all time, Ptolemy. Who had a go at this. Now what's interesting about this, I'm going to describe his model in a second, is this model was the standard view for over 2,000 years and it's wrong. It's fundamentally wrong. But the reason why Ptolemy is wrong in part is because we don't have the data. We don't have any way of deciding who's right, who's wrong. 
in their model of the universe. So what does Ptolemy do? Well, Ptolemy wraps a couple of observations and, and some philosophy together. So the first thing he says is, well, the Earth isn't moving because if it is, we'd all be blown off. And that's actually not, a, not an unreasonable thing to suggest. We all know if you walk, you feel a bit of air, if you run, you feel more, and so on. So you could imagine if the Earth is moving around something, then we'd feel it, and we don't. So it can't be moving. That's wrong, but that's a reasonable observation to make in the first instance. Um, he also noticed that you can explain the movement of the planets. So um, I'm going to come to a problem in a second called retrograde motion. But if you look at the Earth, then let's say Mercury is moving around in its ellipse. Venus is moving around its ellipse. The Sun and so on, sorry, in its circle, is moving in its circle. So things are moving in the sky. That explains why planets move. The stars, on the other hand, for no good reason, are here and they don't move. So that explains why the stars don't move except as one big bunch together. So they just all move together as one big bunch, but they're all fixed the same to each other. So this distance between these two stars never changes. So this model actually explains a lot of what you see in the night sky. It, shows, it explains the planets moving and why they move differently, because Mercury and Venus will move maybe differently to one another, and that's what we see in the sky. The stars all, mix, all move together. However, there is an alternative, immediate alternative, which is that if something like are these and they're moving but they're very very far away then you won't notice them moving so much so the model isn't foolproof but it's the model that puts the earth at the center and it puts us going in things going in circles now circles might not appear as a important but it's going to become very important in a minute or two so if we go to ptolemy's model and we look at does it fit the observation so i think for, again for those of you who are teachers if we Think about what fundamentally drives science, what observation ultimately drives it. Now, you might come up with a theory like Einstein, and we've spent the last hundred years proving or disproving Einstein. So if you're really very smart, and maybe a little bit lucky in the way you, you approach things, you might come up with a model that turns out to be right. But mostly, you, people only pay attention to it if you can prove or disprove it. So if you watch planets in the sky, like this is one of, uh, of, of Mars, then it actually comes along, these are, this is taken every sort of 10 nights, it does this, and then there's this really interesting little loop, and then it continues on its way. So this is an observation called retrograde motion. So Ptolemy said, okay, bit of a problem here, I gotta explain retrograde motion, so what do I do? Well, something quite smart, actually. That's it may be a little bit difficult to see, but you know, it's worth focusing on this just for a minute, because it shows how you can creatively come up with a solution which actually is still the wrong one. So what Ptolemy said was, um, the Earth is still at the center, everything is still going in circles, but let's imagine that you have, for example, Mars over here. Actually, let's take Venus, because it's actually easier. No, we'll take Mars, well, it doesn't really matter. So Mars, instead of just going on this big circle here, this outer circle, is going on a smaller circle, as it goes around the bigger circle. So if you put Mars on a small circle, then look what happens. It goes left to right, then it comes the other direction. Okay, so sometimes it's going this way, sometimes it's going backwards. That's exactly what we see here. Sometimes it's this way, sometimes it's going backwards, and then it goes on again. So this model works, and everybody's happy. Until you... Um, oh yeah, by the way, one thing, sorry, I forgot. I hate that. The sun is now epicycle. So now you have to throw in something. The sun doesn't have an epicycle. So the stars are fixed for no good reason, and the sun doesn't have an epicycle for no good reason. Why? Because it, it fits the observations. Now theories where you start to add in little things like that, like it only works on a blue moon of a second Tuesday after the third month in May type of thing, usually isn't a good way of approaching science. So if you put in random things about we have one model, but it's different for one or two things. That's usually, not always, but usually an indication that there might be a problem with it. Nevertheless, Ptolemy persisted, and in fact so much so that as the observations became more accurate, he realized one epicycle wasn't enough. So what do you do? You put another epicycle on the epicycle. And that um, adjusts the movement of the planets just enough so it works. But this is also inherently random. You just keep on adding stuff in until it fits the data. And just to come back to this assumption 
For non-scientific reasons, for philosophical reasons, the Greeks believed that circles were a perfect form and that in the universe things should hold a perfect form. So they insisted on things going round in circles and they insisted for philosophical, partly, but up some science reasons like this, you wouldn't get blown off the earth, they, they said you've got to be at the centre of the universe. But really, putting us at the centre of the universe was really because we're important. That's what really drove that, not the science. It was the philosophical view that somehow we're really important. There's our first lesson about our place in the universe. As soon as you assume that we're really important, you miss the whole point that we're utterly irrelevant in comparison to the universe. Not irrelevant to one another, but as far as the universe is concerned, we're irrelevant. So these models become challenged by better observations. So what do you do? Well, you hang on to your model for 2,000 years, and then 2,000 years roughly later, Think of that, 2,000 years. So the books are all written and people are making more observations than for 2,000 years. They're afraid to do this, put the sun at the center. If you put the sun at the center uh, of the universe, admittedly, now you still got fixed stars out here. So this guy, Nicholas Copernicus, decided, okay, we'll leave the fixed stars as they were. Let's not go messing with that. But these moving points of light are planets it would be much easier to describe them if we put the sun at the center. And then the earth goes around the sun, so the earth is no longer the center of the universe. Philosophically, this is the big leap. Once you've done this once, everything else is actually relatively straightforward. Because in a way, it doesn't matter whether you're here or here, or whether you go in a circle or a square or something like that. The key point, the key philosophical difference is you no longer have to be the center of the universe. And if you do that, and this is, maybe for tonight, I won't go through it too much, because I know not everybody in, in here is, is, is teaching, but um, the, if you look at it, this model actually predicts retrograde motion um, more naturally. I'll just give you an example. So here's the Earth going around, and here is, say, Mars going around. So Mars is going around a bit more slowly. So if you look from the Earth to Mars, it appears to be here. The Earth continues around, Mars has moved a bit, so now Mars appears to be here. The Earth continues around, now Mars is here. But now as the Earth overtakes Mars, Mars appears to go backwards, and it naturally gives you this little loop. So by simply doing this, no epicycle is required. Now there's a thing called Occam's Razor. I don't know how many of you have heard of Occam's Razor. I always like this. I learned this as, uh, years ago. And Occam's Razor says this, if two theories equally well explain a given phenomenon, and one theory is simpler than the other, then the simpler one is most likely to be the correct one. So I said again, if two theories equally explain something, but one theory is simple and one is complicated, it seems that our universe for the most part chooses the simpler theory. So this is a much simpler model. And Occam's razor, it's not a proof, by the way, would suggest that this is more likely to be the case. So Copernicus said, this sorts out your issues much simpler, and um, uh, he got into all sorts of trouble with the church over that. That's not maybe for tonight's discussion. It did open up the question of why, uh, but I'm happy to chat about it afterwards in a way, but, but it, it did open up the question of why aren't we blown off? The earth. That, still, that still wasn't clear. Why aren't we blown off the earth? If we're barreling around the sun at who knows what speed, why don't we get blown off? This didn't address that particular issue. So people who objected to Copernicus's model chose this as the issue and they said epicycles is okay because this is a bigger problem. And that's actually not, a, that's not completely invalid. You know, if you say, well, you've got two problems here, epicycles or blown off. I know we're not being blown off for sure. So we mustn't be moving. It's not a complete mad suggestion to have. But let's roll the clock a bit forward now. And you're starting to see, by the way, if I just put that, this is the 16th century. And if we move into just the late 16th century, so remember, we've had Ptolemy for almost 2,000 years. Now we got to the 16th century, suddenly something happens. And the next big thing that happens in our understanding of the universe is a guy called Tycho Brahe exists. So Tycho Brahe is probably the greatest visual observer of all time. Uh, there were, this is before the telescope. Uh, Brahe observed the planets with exceptional accuracy, using instruments and his eyes, but no telescopes. And the incredible thing, Tycho Brahe himself was a really fascinating character. 
He lived on an island, the island of Elba, on, on his own, except it wasn't quite on his own because he had a pet elk. And he used to go drinking with his pet elk. And unfortunately, his pet elk died um, in a very nice way. But he, he died when he, when he fell downstairs because he was drunk. Uh, because they used to they used to go drinking together. Um, he also had a, a gold nose because he lost his nose in a duel. Um, so he was a really interesting character, but he was a brilliant observer. So much so that when he published his Where Are the Planets in the Sky, his protege, who was a theoretician, Johannes Kepler, said, I'm going to try to model, to bring a model that will fit Tycho Brahe's observation. So here's the problem. Tycho Brahe's observations were so accurate, it said, this doesn't work either. This, this model isn't good enough. Circles and planets going around in circles, my observations predict, or, or my observations can't be predicted by this. And of course, so Kepler, who believed inherently in Brahe, said, I want to look at your data. Brahe said, not until I die. Kepler said, I want to see a day, not until I die, I want to see a day. So there's this back and forth, back and forth, then Tiger Brahe dies, and then Kepler gets his data. So, um, and what does Kepler do? He thinks about it for a long time, and he said, what if I make an assumption that things go round in ellipses instead of circles? That's all. I'm just going to make one change, ellipses instead of circles. And what happens? Everything falls into all the observations of Brahe at their full accuracy simply fall into place. In fact, not only that, but Kepler was then able to use that and some of the associated maths he built around that to predict really accurately where Mars would be in two years' time, five years' time, which previously you couldn't. Mars would always start to lose its position a little bit when you tried to predict using Ptolemy's model or using Copernicus's model. But come and use Kepler's model and Mars or Jupiter are exactly where you expect them to be. So that gives you great confidence that probably stuff goes round in ellipses and that the Earth isn't at the centre of the universe. So we roll the clock on just a few years. We're still in the 17th century. A really interesting time from an astronomy point of view. By the way, when we come to the end of talking, a few minutes time, I'm going to be telling you about why it's really interesting now again. We're at a really interesting time. This is a really fascinating time. So along comes this guy we all, and most of us will know, and those who are very young will get to know this guy very well as you get old. His name is Galileo Galilei. So he was a businessman, a scientist, a philosopher, many different things. It was quite common in those days. And in 1608, he heard of a guy called Hans Lippersche, a Dutch glassmaker who had talked about uh, being able to see things closer if he used two lenses. And Galileo thought, this is interesting, I need to find out more about this. So he found using some uh, intelligence, we probably call it today, so messengers back then, that this guy Hans Lippershey had actually invented a magnifying device. He did the same type of thing, but he turned into what, of course, we today would refer to as a telescope. Galileo was interested in looking at the stars, in part, and he realized that this would allow him to see the stars more accurately than previously. However, Galileo was a businessman. One of the things he also did with his telescope was he sold time on his telescope to the noblemen in Venice so that they could see ships coming over the horizon before people could see it with their naked eyes. Why? Because if you see a spice ship is coming in, you know the price of spices is going to tumble because there's going to be a lot of spices on the market. You, it's basically insider trading of a different name. So Galileo was also a businessman, in, in a good sense, I, I guess. Is, is insiders trading good? Probably not. But he was a businessman, he had to fund himself, although he had an independent wealth as well. And it was when, but what we remember him for, in terms of our model of the universe, is he turned his telescope to the skies. And he was the first to do that, and that's what makes him really unique. He saw what some of you saw tonight with the telescope, craters. 
Why is this important? Well, people previously, although with the naked eye, quite honestly, you can see craters with your naked eye. So uh, people with good vision would have already kind of noticed this. But with a telescope, they're absolutely clear. You can see craters, you can see moon, you can see mountains, you can see ridges, you can see all sorts of different structures in the moon. And the, the Greeks believed that the moon was a perfect sphere. You could measure it more accurately. It's not perfectly spherical for a start. It's slightly elliptical. Like everything in the very almost nothing is round in the universe, by the way. Uh, so, and the moon is slightly we call it we call it an oblate spheroid. So it's, that's a bit of an exaggeration. It looks round. It's actually slightly bulky at the equator, just like the Earth is. But he also saw when he looked at the sun. And by the way, just to let's remember everybody, never ever look at the sun. Never ever turn a telescope to the sun ever. So what Galileo did was he pointed his telescope towards the sun and he shone it out the back and on a piece, on a piece of paper. And what did he see? He saw these dark spots on the sun. He showed that the sun was blemished. It wasn't perfect. And actually, he also really, he also um, understood that the sun rotated. So he could see the spots moving across. So we thought, well, the simplest way to imagine that is if the sun is a ball that's rotating. So he said, the sun rotates. So this was new, new news. The other thing that he did was he turned his telescope to Jupiter. This is this actually, I know it's very small, I'm not sure if you can see it at the back, but these are some of his drawings. It sounds like I actually have them at home or something, doesn't it? These are some of his drawings. So these are some of his drawings. You can see this is, well, the, round, the, the big round thing is Jupiter, and the two dots either side are two of what we call the four Jovian moons. So, um, but what he showed was that if you, if you observe them for, for many nights, you'll actually see that the simplest way to explain these four dots moving is if they're going around Jupiter. So here you also have a thing where he definitely showed that the moon we, we kind of knew went around the Earth in some sense, but other stuff goes around other stuff. So the Earth isn't that special. And that was something that was really important. And finally, he saw that Venus has phases. Now if you go out in the morning, if you're up very early, you get your dad out very early, you'll see in the morning that there's a very bright star uh, in the west, and that's Venus. If you look at Venus with a telescope, for example, you'll see over a period of weeks that it'll change the size. This is, you can see it's large, and it's a little, a little um, crescent, a bit like the moon is tonight. And then it gets smaller, but it gets more like a disc. And actually the simplest way to explain that is that Venus is between you and the sun, and as it moves around the sun, sometimes it's in a, in a position where the sun is shining face onto it, Sometimes the sun is almost behind it. And so you get phases are perfectly consistent with the sun being at the center, the earth going around, Venus going around, and Venus being inside the earth. So these observations by Galileo challenged the church's view at the time, and also the philosophical view, that the universe had somehow a perfection, what they considered a perfection associated with. If we, oh yeah, one other thing, not such a big deal, but he also noticed that when you turned your telescope, you saw more and more stars. So with the naked eye, how many stars do you think you can see with your own eyes? Rough guess. When you look up in the sky at night, how many stars do you think you can see? Five. Thousands. Five thousand. Anybody else? Ah, uh, okay, now that's a really interesting <laughs> answer. So if we went to somewhere that wasn't <laughs> like pollution. <laughs> thousands, okay, well it's actually, because you know we talk about millions of stars, it is actually only thousands that we see. It's, a, it's, about, it's about half, it's about 5,000 in total between the two hemispheres. So when you turn a telescope there, you actually can start to see many, many more stars. Now why is that important? Well it tells you, for example, that the stars weren't put there just for you and me to look at with our eyes, which is what something the, the, the Greeks thought. They're just for our, the glory of God and so forth, because there's lots of hidden stuff there. And hidden stuff is something that, 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 that uh, didn't fit in well with overall models of the universe. So, then we move a little bit further forward, and where are we still? Look, we're in the 17th, 18th century. We've hardly moved in time, and along comes another major step forward. What's the major step forward? Well, two things. The one, don't sit under an apple tree, obviously. We one note that Isaac Newton would be able to tell you about. And this probably did not happen, but 
always makes a good story. But the, 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 the suggestion is that Newton saw an apple fall and said, the motion of that apple is the same, it's, it's governed by the same law as the motion of the moon. Now, up till now, it's really an important point because this is a fundamental change. And when I talk to students about laws, I can see them, oh, and they get really bored. It's laws. But the thing I would always say, laws are amazing for two reasons. One, we don't make them. You and me don't make the laws. Secondly, our universe has laws. Neither of those things are necessarily obvious. Maybe the first one is, but the second one isn't. And I'll give you an example of a law. It's a very, fairly obvious one. Okay, so I'm going to let that go, and it's going to fall. That's just the way you look. I'm going to do it again, and it does the same thing. Now, I really don't like that. Well, that's tough. Because the law of gravity has a certain way about it. And there is no way that we know of, certainly under normal circumstances, in fact, under any circumstance, that we can manipulate that law. Somehow, when the universe was created, gravity was created with it. But the fact that we know it's there is a huge step forward. And I'll explain to you in a second why. So, Newton said, he actually, and I remember when I went to college, we had the laws, or the universal laws, or the laws of motion, and the universal law of gravitation. I just kind of passed over this universal word. Actually, this is the amazing word in it. It's, un it's the universe. The whole universe is covered by the same laws. And we can tell that that's largely true because when you look in the universe, it looks kind of the same. Remember you said there's stars, planets, no matter where you look, you see maybe more of them, but they're basically the same. The simplest way to explain that is the same laws are the same everywhere. Our Earth doesn't have special gravity laws. They're the same laws as we see elsewhere. Because that explains why things are everywhere are roundy, but not quite fully round. But it also says, and one thing that Newton says, that the law that applies to apples, applies to planets, applies to galaxies, and so on. That's a huge step forward. That's enormous. We've gone from a couple of thousand years previously, in fact, less than 100 years previously, into really thinking that the Earth might be the centre of the universe, into realising that not only is that not the case, but that there are laws that govern the whole universe. And these laws explain these things, big planets, smaller planets, wonderful planets. They explain big stars. Here's the sun in comparison to the planets, you can see how, how large the sun is to scale. Um, and here's some galaxies. So when we look at these galaxies, this one looks different to this. This one looks very weird. This one looks also weird. This, but, but we can call it weird. Well, I'm calling it weird. Maybe you don't want to call it weird. But actually, it turns out that those shapes can all be explained by the universal law of gravity. They may look very different. It's a bit like we all look different, but we're governed by DNA. It's the same thing, there's a code that the universe has underneath it that explains all those shapes. How do we know? Well, if I take Newton's laws and I try to make a model, I'm not going to do this tonight, that makes this shape or this shape, I can do it. So it's like going back to the, the, the thing we are talking about a few minutes ago, about explaining the movement of the planets uh, the, and the problems with it. If we, ex if we assume there's a universal law of gravity, we can explain the shapes of pretty much everything. So it, it, it's got to have some credibility across the universe. It works. And that's the beauty of having laws in the universe. Now, once you have a telescope, yeah. accelerate now, once you have a telescope, you want to make a bigger telescope. Why? Well, if you make the bigger telescope, then two things happen. First of all, you can see more detail, you can magnify more, and secondly, you can see fainter objects. And if you can see fainter objects, you've got the possibility of seeing things that are farther away. Come back down just one second. But if you've never visited Burr Castle, and if you've never seen this telescope, then you've got to do that also. So you've got to, you've got to go to Newgrange. These are orders. You have to get your dad to bring you, by the way, now if he hasn't done that, okay? So you've got to go also to see this. This was the largest telescope in the world for 70 years. 
was built in, in Burden County, Offaly, which hasn't changed very much since this was completed in 1845. It wasn't built in a metropolis. Interestingly, around the same time, there was a reflector built in the in this small city of San Francisco. Interesting to see the difference in developmental path between Burr and San Francisco. I just always think that's an interesting, interesting because they one had the largest telescope with a mirror, which is in Burr. One had the largest telescope with the lens, which was in San Francisco. And the third, and the third Earl of Ross, who lived there, saw this galaxy, and he called it, and it was called by others, a nebula. A nebula means um, cloud. And it's actually like, because we don't know what it is, so we're going to call it nebula. That's kind of, it's a coverall word. And the big issue was, how far away is this? So, looking at it, can you tell how far away it is? I and mean, obviously it's 10 feet away from your 20 feet, but um, the real thing. And you can't. And actually, here's the thing. The next time a person says, I saw a UFO last night, and it was 50 feet long, or, uh, sorry, what's that, 25, six, 30, 20 meters long, and it was 400 meters away. And it's amazing, I used to be interested in UFOs a bit more when I was younger, amazing how people will say they think they know the scale of something. Now, the only way you know that, you could have some idea how, how far away I am, because you kind of know inherently how big people are, roughly. So, but if you don't, if it's a UFO, you have no idea how big it is. So you have no idea how far away it is. So if you have no idea how big this is, you have no idea how far away it is. And if you have no idea how far away it is, you don't know how big it is. It's a circular problem. So something somewhere has to unlock this. But there was a big debate about this. And here's the reason why this was really important. People back in, in at this time, 1845, uh, and right into the 1900s, right in 1910, actually up until 1921, didn't know how big the universe was. So we didn't know how big that was. So the big challenge was to measure the size of the universe. A lot of very smart people saying it's small, it's big, it's small, it's big. And this is where these stars and nebulae, how far away are they? Well, for those of you who remember Father Ted, you'll remember Father... What's his name? Dougal. Trying to explain uh, how far away the cow is. Okay. So, and, and for those of you who aren't so familiar with it, obviously a cow in the field is far away, or a model cow is close up. And, and of course, um, this becomes impossible to, for Dougal to understand in the story. And it's very funny. But actually, this fundamentally tells us the problem in, in astronomy, because we don't know how big the cows in the universe are. Now, well, at least we didn't. We, we, we figured that out. So, in essence, if you can find something whose size you know, or whose brightness you know, and you place it at different distances, then you can tell how far away it is from how big it appears, or how bright it appears. Does that make some sense? So, once you know the size of something, if it appears very small, you can figure out how far it is away. If you know how bright it is, you can figure out how far it is away just by measuring how bright it actually appears. So, we've got to find things whose size we know in the universe. And, in fact, uh, there are such things. I, 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 I'm not going to go into it tonight, if you're glad to hear, because if you think this guy needs to not talk all night. But they're called primary distance indicators. And there's a couple of different things that we know the size of. Uh, through measurements, um, which I, 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 don't, I don't really like when people say just take it on faith, but just take it on faith for, for, the, for in the purpose of today, tonight's talk. So certain stars pulsate, and the, and the speed at which they pulsate, pulsate tell you how bright they are. So you look for stars, you say it's pulsating at a certain rate, so it must be that bright inherently. It looks that bright to me, so it must be that far away. If you do that, then you come up with the early 20th century model of the universe, which is actually the one that we use today. So, a couple of minutes on this. Edwin Hubble was a, 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 a graduate student, and he was asked about measuring the distance to the Andromeda Galaxy. Because the Andromeda Galaxy is a fuzz, you can see it actually at the moment, late at night, still, it's a good time of the year to see it. Um, uh, you can see it with the naked eye. It's two, we now know it's two million light years away, which means that we see it as it was two million years ago. But back in the early part of the 20th century, people didn't know how far away it was. 
No, no idea. So Hubble went and tried to figure out how far it was by actually looking at these Cepheids. So these Cepheids stars are in our galaxy. He said, hmm, I wonder if they're in this other galaxy, the Andromeda galaxy. Sure enough, he found some. He was able then to measure the distance to the Andromeda galaxy. And to use technical term, he, he realized the Andromeda galaxy was very far away much further than had previously been estimated. And he took the same approach because if it, be, if it works in our galaxy and it works in the, the Andromeda galaxy and it work, it's going to work everywhere, that's the assumption you make. And he found that the universe actually was really doing something really interesting, that it was expanding. So he tried to figure out how big is the universe because we didn't know that and he got a better handle on that. But for free, he got this whole new piece of information. The universe is expanding. We didn't know this before Hubble came across it. Hubble didn't try to determine is the universe expanding, he just wanted to figure out how big it was. So that's an amazing discovery. He, he, he discovers roughly how big the universe is, and he discovers that it's expanding. So if something is expanding, and this line here shows, if you like, well, Technically, this, this is showing distance and speed and distance. I don't really know why, I, that's probably not relevant right now. But if you, if you work back the, uh, the, um, the difference in speed, you can work, you can use this slope. I'm realizing here that I'm not gonna explain this properly uh, in, in the context of tonight, but you can use the fact that the universe is expanding in a general way, that if I do this, if, if you see you doing this, you think, okay, let me just run that backwards. And when I get, to everything coming together, that must be the age of the universe. So if I know how big it is, and I know how fast it's expanding, then I can figure out when it must have started. So the other piece of information that Hubble got, three pieces, I mean, talk about lucky. You set out to do one thing, and you find three key pieces of information about your universe. Well, two that were totally unknown. One, that's expanding, and two, how old it is. Because the universe had to come all from a single point at some time in the past and although Hubble got that horribly wrong for various good reasons that set about what I said at the beginning of the talk 13.7 billion years if you do what Hubble does and you map how far away things are and how fast they're moving and you run the picture back you get 13.7 billion years that's an astonishing discovery only um, 100, 200 years after we realized the Earth wasn't the center of the universe. We've gone to having no idea how big the universe is and to thinking we're at the middle of it all, to realizing we're a tiny speck in an enormous universe which is expanding and started out at some time in the past, so isn't infinitely old. Now, roll on to almost, almost your, the two girls at the front of you are almost old enough to remem remember this. But about 20 years ago now, so a little bit, a little bit more. I'm, I'm realizing I have to re amend my almost estimate. Um, two groups set out to refine this expansion of the universe. They wanted to know, is the universe 13.7? Is it 13.8? Is it 13.5? What exactly, how fast is it? And they also want to know, is the universe expanding? Uh, and is it, is it expanding at the constant rate? Is it slowing down? Most people felt it was probably slowing down, so th that our universe is going to go sort of out and collapse back to a point and then start again and, and so on. And this was kind of what was assumed. There was no f strong basis for it, but it was kind of assumed. So people said, okay, that's great. So we figure out how the universe um, is expanding. So. Uh, this is this slide. I've done it in reverse. I just realized I was looking at the wrong slide, so I have to go back to that other slide. So these two groups trying to figure out um, how fast is the universe expanding. So actually, the model that they, that they were trying to figure out or thought was most likely is you start at a point, the universe gets bigger, and then it goes back to a point again. That's the, the, the one I just mentioned. However, another possibility is the universe expands and then gets no bigger, reaches a certain size and is always the same size forevermore. Another possibility is the universe gradually gets bigger, which is this one here. Or one that nobody predicted. I mean, nobody was talking about this. What these two groups found in 1998 is that in fact the universe has been getting bigger, 
but the rate at which it's getting bigger is getting faster. We are accelerating the expansion of the universe. So in the last 20 years, we've realized that our universe is literally blowing itself apart. And it, it truly is blowing itself apart. So at the moment, the atoms in your body hold themselves together. In quadrillions of years into the future, I just made that up, by the way, okay, that's, not a real, that's not a real unit. But in quadrillions of years in the future, the, the stretch of the universe will rip even the atoms apart so that the nuclei and so on that go together and the electrons around them will be ripped apart by the very fact that the fabric of the universe in which we sit will be ripped apart. But, and apologies for doing it in the, in the wrong sequence. It doesn't really matter in a sense, but I just started the commentary in the wrong sequence. We also then were trying to figure out about how heavy the universe was. So we're trying to measure how, how much mass is in this galaxy. So we look here, you see, oh, there's a lot, there's a lot of light here. So there must be 100,000 million stars. So you know what, what the mass of the galaxy is. So what, you can do a trick. You can measure how fast things are moving as you move out from the center. So if you go, as you move out, this is what we call five, just units of distance. And, and then you measure how fast the stars are moving. So what we expect under Newton's laws is we expect the graph to go up. So the stars, as you move further out, should be traveling faster. And then as you travel further away, that should kind of level off. So when you're very far away from a galaxy, the stars very far away should be traveling at a constant speed. Well, you know, whether you're that distance or that distance. When you're that distance or that distance, you're at roughly the same speed. But there's also a peak. You expect this to be the fastest the stars are moving. What happens is, you plot the curve, it does this. Now, even if you're thinking, I'm not really sure what, what he's getting at here, here's the thing. We can all see that this and this are not the same. So one theory predicts this. This is Newton's laws of motion, which I said are wonderful, and we should all celebrate. Job done. And then we find this, which doesn't follow Newton's laws of motion. So we start to look for lots of matter that might be out here. Because if there's a big load of dark stuff out here, which you can't see, and I don't have any applause, by the way, for my graphical abilities here. I think we can all agree that I've taken the the rather expert course in Microsoft PowerPoint. But if we, if we put lots of matter out here, this graph becomes this graph. So we think, ah, there must be lots of matter way off out beyond the galaxy, what we call a halo. We go to look for it, and we can't find it. So we can't find this stuff, but we know that it's there because it's doing, it's making this actually happen. The stars are actually following this, so there's something weird there. This is the dark energy, sorry, the dark matter that I referred to at the very start of the talk. This expansion of the universe is the dark energy that we refer to. So dark matter is causing somehow our galaxies to rotate differently to the way they should. Should. They're actually supposed to rotate that way clearly because they do. So should just means that that's what we expect them to. Dark energy causes our universe to accelerate in how fast it's expanding. A real surprise for us. So, dark energy is blowing the universe apart. Dark matter is trying to stop this. So actually this dark matter that we showed there around the galaxy is trying to pull the universe back this way. Dark energy is trying to push the universe that way. And clearly because of this graph here, we can see who's winning. It's the stuff that's pushing the whole universe apart is doing the winning. So the dark energy is winning. And the best bit of it all is we don't have a clue what this is. So I'm predicting that our two young scientists in the front row and our young scientists in the middle there will be the ones to figure out what this is all about. Because this is going to take a bit of time and effort to figure out what this is. So in conclusion about our models, this is the way we think that the universe has gone over the last 13.7 billion years. Now, I don't want, even if you've just slept through half of this, I don't want you to go away not realizing some amazing stuff has gone on. So let me try to very quickly 
recapture the amazing stuff that's gone on. And, and where we now know. Because let's see for a second something. We sit on this, we now know we sit on this very small ball that we call Earth, in this very big universe. And yet, with our relatively, in terms of scale, our relatively small sized brains, even if we aggregate the entire volume of all our brains together, it's really small. And yet, we've been able to figure out without really ever leaving this planet. Because almost everything that I've talked to about tonight, we know by making observations with telescopes sitting on the planet. Some with telescopes in space. How far in space? A couple of hundred miles. They're, they're, in the scale of the universe, it's nothing. It's absolutely zero. Even if you go to Mars, you haven't even, it's just no distance at all. So everything we know about our universe basically happens because we're able to sit on this planet make a certain number of observations and come up with self-consistent laws which explain up to a point the way our universe looks. So we think that the universe started in this big bang 13.7 billion years ago. We think that it expanded very quickly. I didn't mention this part but this is the only part which we didn't mention. And then as time goes on the universe, you know, it's getting a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger, not too much, but then, all of a sudden, it's starting to really take off. So for a lot of its history, the universe was expanding gently. The very beginning, it expanded very quickly, then it expanded gently, and then, now, it's really beginning to, to rev up again. And you know the scary thing is, we don't know what happens to this. We have no idea, this will kind of go, and zip. We could all be blown apart tomorrow. So, uh, we might, some, might reach some critical size in the universe, and all of a sudden the universe just decides, okay, that's it. And, and, and that, so we don't actually know. So we, we don't actually, any line that projects forward is, is a guess. Because we don't know what's causing it. We call it dark energy. We don't know what's causing it. So we don't know what's going to happen to the next bit. This diagram, we didn't know in this detail at all 20 years ago. We, we had a different diagram 20 years ago. So. Let's not be too, you know, arrogant about where we, where, the, where we think the universe is going to go. But really interesting that we do have a model. And we see that stars and so on get born and they get reborn. They build planets and all of that type of th things. And this is where we basically are today. And then there's a big sort of question mark that you can imagine about where we're going and what's going to happen next. So we know this, but are we the only universe? So if we ask... Two questions. One, where are we going? Does this curve continue? What does it do? Does it even fall back on itself? Maybe it does fall back on itself. We, we, we don't know. Does dark energy get tired? Does it get stronger? We don't yet know the answer to that. But we can ask lots of other questions. Why is gravity attractive? I'm glad it is, because otherwise it would be a bit awkward. It was repulsive. Um, why is it the strength it is? Why is it not more? Well, why, is it, why is the value it is? Why does light travel at the speed of light? Well, obviously light is going to travel at the speed of light. That happens to be 3 by 10 to the 8 meters per second. And here's the thing, when I went to college, people say the speed of light 2 by 10 to the 8 meters per second. And I remember thinking, why is it 3 by 10? Why is it that number? And I was too afraid to ask. It was years later that I thought, why is it 3 by 10 to the 8 meters per second? Why is it 300,000, 3,000 million meters per second? What, why? I'll come back in just one second, almost finished. But it's a good question. Why? Why are atoms stable? So you might think, well, of course they're, st of course they're stable. Well, that's not obvious. So if you look inside, if you think about the atoms in your body, the atoms in anything, by the way, I often say in your body, but they don't have to be in your body. Uh, they're just there, you know, they're just there, they, they just are. Um, and we, we know that there's kind of a nucleus and electrons going around those. Um, but if you actually look at it, the nucleus is incredibly finely balanced. If you were to look at the, 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 the balance on that, it's, it's more unlikely that a, that a nucleus is balanced in terms of forces to hold it just together. What's the two options way? If it's unbalanced, it could break apart or it could collapse in on itself. But it just stays nicely there. It just stays nicely stable, most, most nuclei. 
radioactive was a bit of a, a bit of a kind of example. There's a good reason why. But most nuclei stay good and solid for billions of years, thankfully. Why? There is no good reason why that needs to be the case. In fact, the probability that nuclei are unstable is much higher. It's easier to make unstable nuclei than stable nuclei. So one of the things that might be the case is that in our universe, one of maybe an infinite number of universes, these things just are the numbers they are. In another universe, the numbers associated with these things are different. So gravity, maybe in some universes, it's much weaker. Maybe it's repulsive in some universes. If it's repulsive, you can't build planets. So in those universes, there's no planets, there's no stars, because gravity pulls stuff together to make planets and stars. In those universes, maybe things are much stronger, so you weigh more or less, you weigh less. In other universes, maybe the speed of light is some completely different number altogether. In other universes, maybe atoms aren't stable. In those universes, again, you don't build interesting things. You can't build big long chain molecules that make up you and me. These are not so, from our perspective at least, the first order, are not such interesting universes. So we live in a universe where things are kind of nicely balanced. That's, that's a great place to be. But we also know, actually let me just before, that's my last slide, before, also, we also know the following. If you, or at least we think we know the following, I'm very careful with this one. If you think, when you're, if, and if we go back to asking questions in our classrooms, we have models which we've had to keep on changing. And in recent times, we've built up a model of the universe. But that model, Ask, encourages us to ask other questions, fundamental questions, about the role of our universe. So when, when people say to you, if, if your pupils say to you, but you know, why is the sun the size it is? In a way, there is no answer to that. In our universe, it just so happens that gravity is a balance between that and, and the pressure that you get from heat and so on, that the equations just make stars that are kind of like that in this, in this universe. But in other universes, this may not be the case. But coming back to my penultimate point, one of the things I think that's also the universe tells us, and I always think this is really interesting because we talk about the model as if it's kind of an inanimate thing, but to the best of what we can say, with our current knowledge of the universe, most of the universe doesn't know it exists. So you and me, if we're not sleeping, do know that we exist. This is an amazing thing to be in the universe. The vast majority of the universe is not able to understand itself. We are. So philosophically even, the fact that we have consciousness, that somehow our molecules put themselves together, and whatever else has to happen, and that gets into all sorts of potential philosophical and other discussions. But the net result, irrespective of how those discussions get moderated, are that we're incredibly lucky to have been able to, to understand what we just discussed tonight. To be part of understanding that and being part of figuring that out. That's a privilege. That's something that astronomy tells us. So our building of the model of the universe fundamentally tells us that we're special and that we need to look at, well, we don't have to, but I think it tells us that you have to look after each other. Uh, that, for me, is the un one of the unexpected outcomes of trying to build what you might consider a physics or chemistry-based model of the universe. And it's encapsulated much better by Carl Sagan. Every one of us is, in the cosmic perspective, precious. If a human disagrees with you, let him or her live. In a hundred billion galaxies, you will not find another. And another, the final quote, imagination will often carry us to worlds that never were, but without it, we go nowhere. And I think what that tells us is the history of the modeling of our universe, that every time we think we know, there's some new interesting twist. 
Maybe that won't go on forever. But with dark energy and dark matter, we're definitely in a twist situation at the moment. And we, we need to see how that's going to play out. But it also tells us that we live in a universe which is inherently against us, and yet we survive, and yet we thrive. So let's not be the architects of ourselves throwing that away, because we've been given such an amazing opportunity in such a large universe uh, to look after what we have, and we should really grasp that. And for me, I'd always want to get that thought across to our students as well, because otherwise it just becomes a lesson in circles and ellipses and that type of thing. And it's so much more the story of who we are. And that's why modelling our universe is really important to, to understand. So I've gone on a bit longer than I intended, but thank you all for staying for so long. I really appreciate it.